David K. Johnston has been on my show many times in the past. I really encourage all of you to read his books, especially if you have free market people in your life. <laughs> he re they really need to read his books. And David, I understand you want to start off tonight with a, uh, a joke. Well, this being San Francisco, the yes. city of my birth, I was born here. Um, we'll see who can, if somebody can quickly answer this. On the last doubling birth date of the 20th century. In the last what? Doubling birth date. For example, the first doubling birth date was January 2nd, 1904. <laughs> so what's the last doubling birthday? Yeah. What? You know journal center than that. Come on, I'm in digital city here. I grew up in analog city. This is not digital city. If one, two, four, then the last doubling birth date of a century would be <laughs> You're making it really hard. What? No. One, two, four, January second, nineteen oh four. The second one would be um, would be two, four, eight. How many months are there in a year? Twelve. So the last one would be. No, twelve, twenty. This is interesting. This is about twelve, twenty-four, forty-eight. Twelve, twenty-four, forty-eight. I wonder if there's an app for that. <laughs> So I, so I host your call, and it's a daily radio show from 10 to 11. It's a call-in show on KALW. I hope you can tune in. Independent journalism, we really need it. The SF Public Press is doing amazing work. And the last time we did a show about the gig economy, I don't like to use the word sharing when we're talking about this. I was curious about other services besides Uber and TaskRabbit. And I found that you can order a house cleaner, a chef, someone that will stock your bar and bartend for you, a personal shopper, a masseuse, you can pay to have your packages shipped, and then there's a butler. So if you have so many of these services and you can't figure out how to be home five times a day, you can hire someone in your neighborhood to go sit in your house and accept and deliver all these services, and they call that a butler. So the numbers are all over the board, and I wonder what you think about this, David, because there's a new survey up by Emergent Research, and this seems kind of low to me, but it says that by the year 2020, <coughs> the number of Americans working as independent contractors for these companies will double from the 3.2 million now to more than 7.6 million. That seems low to me, though. I, 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 that probably is low, okay. but the number of people in that kind of employment is going to continue to rise because that's what the legal system is allowing to happen. And so. Yeah. All right, so the question is, is this new? No. Um, I teach, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I've taught law at Syracuse University for the last eight years, and I also have graduate business students. And one of the things they learn about in one of my courses is that there were wage and hour courts. That you, you get in dispute with your employer today, you go to the Labor Department, and they have an administrative law process called the wage and hour court. Well, they had wage and hour courts, and we have the trial records from 3,500 years ago in Egypt. The ancients figured out all this stuff a long time ago, and everything since then is just filigree. And so we have always had legal issues about how do we pay people, what's fair in paying people, what are the rules of how you pay people. The Old Testament is full of this stuff. Hammurabi's Code, which is what my classes both begin with, are full of this. Uh, there's Roman law about it. There's a long legal history about the issues of paying workers fairly and how you pay them and what the duty of the employer is to the worker. According to this survey, 76% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. 76%. And the independent contractors that they interviewed said that while they like some of the flexibility with their schedule, they don't like, and this is not very surprising, but they're not guaranteed a wage, they don't get pay, paid family and sick days, and they don't get health insurance. So what else makes this industry stand out from people who do have job security? What makes it stand out? And what's different? Oh, what's different? Well, we've changed labor law in America dramatically in the 36 years now that we have lived in the age of Reagan. 
Um, we had the New Deal, which operated from 1933 until the election of Reagan, and it began shifting under the Democrats shortly before that. And what we've done is systematically reduced the rights of workers and the responsibilities of employers. And we have given employers an enormously great deal more flexibility. Now, we have always had, will always have, and we should have opportunities for employers to hire people as what can be called casual labor, to hire them for short-term periods, to uh, hire people on a piecework basis. I'm mostly a gig economy worker now. I was a salaried newspaper man for 40 years, but I now make most of my money out of the places I write columns for, the Daily Beast, Investopedia, when I... Uh, wrote for Al Jazeera America before they went out of business, unfortunately. Um, USA Today, that's all gig economy work, where I'm in control and they pay me a fee. Um, and that's appropriate given my circumstances. But I've thought back about what it would have been like when I was 19 years old and the San Jose Mercury hired me as a staff writer if I didn't have a salary. Because I had a salary, because I was guaranteed overtime and I was out there scooping up every dollar I could, because I had health care and a paid vacation, I was able to raise on a newspaper man's salary eight children. Um, I was able to buy a house. And one of the things that's happening is, imagine for a moment, just think about this for a moment, imagine you're in the business of being a mortgage lender. That's what you do for a living. You may actually be putting your own money out to be loaned. You get to loan money to people on a 30-year note who have a gig economy job? How about just financing a car? The average car loan in America now is five years, 59 and a half months. Five years is a practical matter. Do you loan money to people on a car for five years if they don't have the security of, of employment? And this change is taking place because we have... It's one of many, many things where we are changing the law in ways the ancients warned us not to do. The Sumerians, the Israel, Israelites, the Egyptians, the Romans, the Greeks, they all warned us about this, about giving too much power to the employer and not enough power to workers and reducing the responsibilities. And if you're an employer, if you can get people to work for you for less money, if you can get them to put in 60 hours for 40 hours of pay and not give them any benefits. Uh, you know, Greg Mankiw, uh, George Bush's chief economic advisor who teaches the biggest economics course at Harvard and is the author of a popular book, his morality system says, of course you should do that. You know, if they, of course you should do that if you're an employer. And so this will continue. We will see a huge expansion of this and a reduction in people who have the stable incomes of being an employee unless we change the law. And guess what? It's a democracy. We can change the law. It's a human construct. We can change that so that we get a stable, prosperous, healthy society. All right, so talk a little bit more about that. What could, for example, the city of San Francisco do? Because it is home to a lot of these companies. Well, it's very hard for a municipal government to have a lot of influence because of the way our constitution is written. Under the, our constitution, the federal government is preeminent but it's co-equal with the state. So anywhere that there's a conflict, the federal government's preeminent. Labor law is an area where the federal government is basically preeminent. And unlike, say, Canada, where provinces and local governments are sub-entities of the federal government. But the things San Francisco could do include, uh, the city gives out all sorts of favors to corporations. It can say, we're gonna do this on these conditions. If you want this, you're gonna have to meet these conditions. Uh, the city can require that contractors, who this is what President Obama just signed in his executive order, you provide services to the city of San Francisco, you will meet the following standards. And that is an area where the city has pretty broad authority. The one area it might have trouble with, uh, because of the way labor law has gone through the courts, is if it said you could only hire residents of San Francisco. That probably is not going to work unless their law enforcement and private contractors are not cops or firefighters. Mm -hmm. so, so talk about how this industry is so unpredictable. Because Instacart, which is the company that allows you to say, I want kale and peanut butter and chocolate from Rainbow Grocery. Someone will go to Rainbow and put all that stuff in a bag. And I've seen these workers. 
I mean, they're running around getting the stuff and then they have the bag and then they put it in their cars. And the other day I asked one, I said, are you making a living doing this? And he said, you know, it depends on how many bags I deliver, how fast I can get to these places. Sometimes I make minimum wage, sometimes I make more. So Instacart is valued at $2 billion. Before I ask a question about that, what does valued mean exactly? It means, because that, it means that they're privately held, but if they were publicly traded, it means that if all the shares traded at the price of the last sale, then that's what the company would be worth. So if a stock is selling at $10 a share and there are 10 shares of stock, the company's worth $100 in the market. It's called market capitalization. However, the last sale is not control. It's minority sales. Control should be worth more. So in the example I gave you, there's 10 shares in the company at $10 each. If you bought six shares to get control of the company, the other shareholders you're buying out would probably expect you to pay 15 or 17 or $18 for those shares because you now get the benefits of being in control. You, know, you, you get the perks, you get the executive salaries, you get the opportunity to take the company private if you want and other things. All right, so Instacart is valued at $2 billion and it recently announced changes to salary. And Recode reported this and then others followed. So they are going to decrease the hourly rate by 40% or more. A high-performing Instacart worker in one major city once made more than $25 an hour thanks to their speed. That person will now make about $15 for the same amount of work. Recode interviewed Maggie Jackson Connolly in Boulder, Colorado, who said, quote, it's totally a 99% and 1% thing. Corporate employees get this fun, exciting environment, and the 99% were not even spoken to or responded to, end quote. So these workers, their wages can change overnight. Well, actually, my guess is they're not being paid wages. They're being paid on a piecework basis. Right. So let's say they work five hours right. and they're consistently right. making so, $300. So here's what money. economic theory says should happen. If you pay a premium wage, you can cream the market and hire the best workers, and they will be the most productive. If you do what this company is doing, the company should be less efficient. And if I were thinking about buying stock in that company, I would go, I don't want to buy stock in this guy's company because they're going to have a hard time retaining workers and getting them to stay with them to do good work. There's an old principle in business that has been forgotten. When I was uh, a young man 45 years ago, going to college at San Francisco State, one of the things I was taught by one of the professors there was an old adage in business. Properly paid employees are free because they pay for themselves. If you underpay, you make the business inefficient and you are less prosperous as an owner. And if you overpay, they're eating money that you should be getting as the owner, and therefore you're less well off. And corporate America, when it comes to employees, knows how to pay people. They've done enormous studies of what to do. They do things called pay comparability. Um, but when you get away from being an employee and you make someone part of the gig economy, now you're in a whole different world. And the only way the gig economy works is if we do not have full employment. If we have full employment, uh, if, if you were my brother, a manual laborer, uh, sometimes worked as a um, assistant manager of McDonald's or things like that, uh, but basically a manual laborer, when he came of age and got out of high school at the end of the 60s, he never worried about finding a job. Mm -hmm. He quit or got fired or wanted to go off with some girl for two weeks. He could find a job instantly. <laughs> That's not true in this economy, even if you have a college degree, because we've changed the rules of the economy. And the gig economy depends on artificially suppressing the employment rate, and therefore artificially increasing the unemployment rate. And you should pay attention when the government reports its numbers, not to the basic employment and unemployment rate, but to something called U6. And you can go on the internet and just say, jobless or unemployment U-6, U as in unicorn. And it will tell you, the people who would like to work full-time but can only find part-time work, people who are not looking for work but would if they thought it was available. So you get a much bigger measure of this. And just one other item about that. The overall percentage of adults who are working is down. You're going to hear a lot about this in the campaign and attacking the Democrats in particular. It's actually a good thing that it's down. Do you want everybody working? You know, and what about people who are near or at retirement age who say, ah, done enough, I don't want to work. If they're under 65, then they're counted. 
as being part of this decline in the labor force participation rate. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. We, we, we prospered just fine as a society when we had uh, people in the high 50s as a share of the workforce who were working. So let's talk a little bit about the workforce because it's changed so drastically. Unfortunately, we don't really have many labor reporters in this country. We get the business section, but we don't hear much about labor and unions. So last week we did a show with Tamara Drought. She works with Demos and she's out with a new book called Sleeping Giant. And it's about how the working class is really the service sector working class. These are people who are serving people because we don't really make much anymore. So janitors, hotel workers, in fact, they just marched down the downtown San Francisco yesterday <laughs> to fight for the right to organize. Retail, restaurant, home care workers, they're majority women and people of color because white people were able to go to college and work their way out of the working class. People of color and women were not. And these are very low paid workers. We don't hear about them much because we don't have labor reporters and the presidential candidates sure aren't talking about them. Now what shocked me about her research, David, two thirds of these people do not have a college degree. And yet you hear from the Dems, everybody who says more education, you're gonna get a great job. But that's just not happening and, that's, and they shouldn't, right? You shouldn't have to get a college education in order to get a good paying job. No, and many people are not equipped to have a college education. We can't run a society on the basis of, hi, we're going to design this society for everybody whose IQ is above 110, and the rest of you, tough luck. That just will not produce social stability. Um, we have always had a servant class. I did a story in the New York Times in, I think, 1996 for Labor Day, in which I showed from books on etiquette and other sources that in the at the turn of the century around the year 1900 uh, family cook was paid better than someone who works at McDonald's then and I used New York City McDonald's wages for my example because the family cook got a small salary they lived in the house typically and they got therefore room and board in addition to their salary and they didn't pay taxes someone who works as a cook at McDonald's they have to ride the subway to and from work in all likelihood. They have taxes taken out of their paycheck, and they're not getting room and board, so they've got to feed themselves and house themselves, and they're actually worse off. We've actually pushed down people near the bottom compared to, of all times, the end of the robber baron age and the gilded age. Uh, employers, with, and, and I've Understand, I've been the head of a union and negotiated a contract, and I'm the co-founder of a successful little company I'm no longer involved in with 25 workers. So I've been both sides of this. Employers will always generally try to pay the lowest wages with the least benefits and the, uh, whatever they can get away with. There will be a few employers who will do what we did. We pay this much more than everybody else in town, and therefore we could cream the market. The Los Angeles Times, a notoriously anti-union company, when I worked there in the 70s and 80s, here in San Francisco and later in Los Angeles, they had the highest paid janitors, the highest paid telephone operators, the highest paid everything. And as a result, they were able to hire the very best people. I literally once called from a motel room in the middle of, I don't even remember where, awful, out in the sticks, America, and said, here's the name of this guy, he's somewhere in Angola. Oh, there's a civil war going on at the time in Angola. And I have to get him on the phone sometime in the next four hours uh, for my story to run on the front page tomorrow. And Louisa, the operator, I lay back in my little crummy hotel room that I found and am asleep and the phone rings and Louisa says, David, I have Mr. So-and-so on the phone for you in Angola. Now, think about the last time you called a company and just tried to say, hey, I, I got the wrong person, where do I, I don't know. <laughs> Is there a company phone book? No. <laughs> Companies have shifted all these costs off onto you. And so we're gonna see a continuation of that trend for as long as it, it can go. And pushing down workers, and you talked about labor reporters. <clears throat> One of the biggest mistakes the newspaper industry has made is in its business coverage. Think about when, when you read a business section. Ban banks are covered from the point of view of bankers not bank customers, even though very few newspaper readers own a bank and almost everybody has a bank account. 
When I went to Atlantic City to cover the casino industry, every month they would, everybody reported in the East Coast, the win in Atlantic City last month, Trump Plaza was the winningest casino. Well, the win is the same as the players' losses. So the very first month I was there, I wrote a story that said, Atlantic City gamblers had record losses last month, and the losingest casino was Trump Plaza. And this continued until the month I left the paper, whereupon they went back to doing it like everybody else. But, you know, labor reporter. Why do we have a labor reporter? What, what, you know, why isn't that just an basic part of the coverage? How are workers doing? That's most people work. Yep. How can people who work in the gig economy organize? And what are your thoughts about some of these efforts? So Uber, Lyft, and sidecar drivers have started this organization called App-Based Drivers Associations. The California branch teamed up with the Teamsters back in August for lobbying assistance. And then during the Super Bowl, about 20 Uber drivers tried to block a busy intersection near Levi's Stadium in protest of company practices, but Santa Clara police quick, quickly halted the demonstration. And then 200 drivers honked their horns and tried to slow traffic outside of Uber's downtown San Francisco office last month. I mean, this is happening on a regular basis now. Oh, and then in France, I mean, there, there's fires in the road because they're so angry about what's happening in Paris, I think that was. Well, I don't, I'm not sure organizing is the way to do this. There will be people who are going to organize protests and demonstrations, there's going to be trouble over it. There are a couple of basic economic questions. If the government said to have a taxi, you've got to be licensed and fingerprinted and buy a medallion, and then you say, well, we're going to shift away from that. Okay, we're going to shift away from that. But first of all, don't we have a, an obligation to the people who helped pay for those medallions to buy them out? And shouldn't it be the people who benefit from the new industry who should buy it out instead of you and me, because they're the beneficiaries? Seems to me that would be the first thing to do is say, we'll let you have Uber and Lyft. You just got to pay what the last sale was for a, uh, or the, the average of the last hundred sales of a medallion to all these people in cash and buy their licenses. Then, then we've had a fair economy about that. Um, I think that because of the mobility of workers, because Congress has passed so many laws to make it almost impossible to organize a union, that the alternative is that government has to become the proxy for people in setting the basic standards. We need to have government saying, this is the minimum wage, this is the number of hours when you've got to pay. And we have to have inspectors to check for that. You know the United States of America has fewer federal labor inspectors today than in 1940. There are about 157 million people who will, in round number, 157 million, say close to 160 million people this year, who will have a paid job at some point where they get a W-2 statement at the end of the year. A third of those will make less than 15000 and their average will be about $6,000. So they're clearly not full-time workers. Uh, and about 100 of them will make over $50 million, and their average will be, depending on how the economy is, it'll be in the neighborhood of $100 million, 90 to $100 million. Half the workers will make less than twenty-eight or 29000 a number that has been unchanged when you adjust for inflation since 1998. It is the median wage, half make more, half make less, has been stuck now for 17 years at the level of 1998. You're not going to organize people given the negatives of the law other than for protests. So I think the way to go at it is government should set minimum standards on pay. Government should say to companies that want to hire people in various ways, here are the licensing standards you have to meet. Here are the conditions you have to meet in order to do business. There is no right to be a business that is incorporated. You have a right to live. You have a right to be a sole proprietor. But you do not have a right to have an entity, a corporation, an LLC, an LP, a partnership. Those are not rights. Those are artificial entities that are creatures of the state. And we can set the rules for them. You know how many... Um, Corporations there were in British colonial America, which existed from the early 1600s until 17, uh, uh, 1779, when we is that the year? The, after 1776, when we defeated the British because they sent their fifth rated troops here. There were seven. Six of those were what today we would call a public utility. The very first was the Boston Waterworks. That's a public utility. Or a charity. There was one. 
created solely for the purpose of making money. It was in the, uh, what was then called the New Haven Colony, later became enlarged to be Connecticut. And it was such a scandal, they had to shut it down within a year, it took the colonial legislature 10 years to clean up the mess, and there was no right to form a corporation. The Constitution doesn't mention anything about cor forming corporations. The states do corporations. And we can set different rules for corporations. We've set this incredibly low bar for them. We shouldn't do that. So if you don't think organizing <coughs> is effective, for people here... For, for protests. So. For, 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 right. So for people here who have jobs with some of these companies, how can they advocate for themselves? <coughs> First of all, I feel for you terribly because it's going to be a tough row. And, and uh, this is not comforting, but here's the reality that nothing important is ever accomplished without hard work. doesn't matter if it's raising children, your kids, developing your own mind, it's, it's work. And if you're not prepared to do the work, then I don't have a lot of sympathy for you. Now, having said that, um, the number one answer to that is we have to get people to the polls and get them to vote, and we have to vote out politicians who are acting against your interests. In, in some of my books that are for sale over there, you, I talk about how all these politicians run for office, and there are a lot of them. You've probably gotten sometime during your life a picture of somebody running for Congress, and there is their spouse and their children standing maybe on the steps of a church or a synagogue or, or a mosque. And yet they pass laws that if you read the common text of those religions, the Old Testament, are described with a very plain, simple, unambiguous word evil. To take from the widow to give to the king, the Old Testament says, is evil. To uh, take someone who is so poor, the only security they have for a loan is their sleeping cloth. You have to return that cloth to them at the end of the day so they don't freeze to death at night. And failure to do so is evil. To not uh, provide for people by leaving some of the gleanings in the field so the poor can go in and collect food by doing the work to collect it is evil. And we need to recognize that we have all sorts of policies that are evil. And we have the power, but you got to vote. you got to know who you're voting for. You don't need money. You don't need money. The biggest mistake I see, uh, if you look at the election in Wisconsin where we have a government that's run on Cokean principles, right? We have a governor who is just a vassal of the Koch brothers, who are, by the way, serious people and good businessmen. They run really well-done businesses. Do not, they're not evil in that sense. They believe with their stuff and they're doing what they think they should do. But their guy, Governor Walker, didn't get recalled. Why? You know what the unions did? They put all this money. They don't have the money of the Koch brothers. They put all this money to buying TV ads. What they should have done is gone to a bunch of unemployed people on election day and said, hey, Rose, I, you got a car that runs well, right? We're going to put gas in your car. We're going to give you $200. We want you to drive people to the polls all day. At the end of the day, we're going to fill your car up with gas again. I ran the numbers on this. They could have hired all the people they needed to get people to the polls who didn't vote for the cost of one ad that ran on one station, the total bill for that station, in Milwaukee. So it's not the whole state. Uh, be, you know, organize people to get the government to change its policies because it's government policy that is underneath all of this. So you you described <coughs> policies that could change earlier. Is the, have you seen any of these policies implemented anywhere? Yep. Where? Well, let's see. Uh, we had a change in government policy that took place uh, between 1861 and 1865, um, where we said we're not going to have people own other people anymore. It was an expensive change. About 750,000 people died, about 38,000 of them black Americans, but we changed policy. Uh, we used to have a policy that we had children working in factories. And you can go back and research, I've got news clips of this at home, uh, the Jerry Falwells and the Pat Robertsons of that era who went around saying, it is God's plan that these children work in the factories and those who are in favor of the child labor laws, they are the agents of the devil, I tell you. Well, we get child labor laws. There are no more six-year-olds running around in dangerous factories in the country, and when we occasionally find that, guess what? We arrest and prosecute people and send them off to prison. Um, we got, uh, women got the right to vote. Women had no power to vote. 
And, and how did they get the right to vote? Well, men, overwhelmingly white men, voted to give women the right to vote. 